So remember, we have function f of oh, s of g. We have function g that go from the instances to the labels. And for each such function g, we construct a corresponding function f that goes from x and y to the uh, real number, let's say, and such that f of the pair x, y is the indicator function that g takes a mistake on x, y. Okay, so for each function d, we have a function f like this and reverse it. And uh, so we have a class of this function d, we have a class of this function f, and we define here the risk, r of d, which is the probability of making a mistake. And equivalently, so R of G is actually the expectation of F. Well, I, I write it P of F. Okay. And equivalently, we have uh, the empirical error, so the same quantity but computed on beta. Rn of G is just the average uh, frequency of error, with indicator that P of Xi yi and rx of g and denoted by pf of f, the empirical expectation of the function f. Okay, so this is, I mean, it's convenient to work with this function because then we have, um, we have just to compare expectation with empirical expectation, whereas here, it's not exactly clear what uh, the relationship is between those quantities. It's just a proper of writing. Okay. So if you recall cutting inequality, it tells us that uh, the difference between the average, the true average and the empirical average of the fixed function, so here we consider function n in the class uh, Australia, and this difference, uh, this difference is large with low probability. And here I am already use this inversion trick, which means that I have set the right hand side to delta okay, uh, of f here, mm -hmm. just think of it as delta here, and here I have expressed the epsilon as a function of delta. So this is what I get, and actually I can, I mean, I'm allowed, since f is a fixed function, I'm allowed to make delta depend on f. That does not change the bound. I can say delta is a certain function of f, and write it down that it will, it will be valid. Okay? So now the idea is that once we once we do that, we gain some flexibility. We can play with this function delta of f. And in particular, if we now uh, apply the union bound, which which is uh, which means we do the following, we consider now the probability that not for this function, but for any function in the class f, the deviation is larger than a certain quantity that depends on f. Then this is the union of all the events corresponding to each function f. And this union of events is less than the sum of the probability of the events, which means the sum of these n times. Okay? That's just applying the union bound of A or B is less than P of A plus B of B. Okay? But now what we have here is that we can choose delta of F in a certain way. For example, we can set delta of F to be some fixed delta, some fixed real number, small, times P of F. And what is P of F? It's just some kind of probability measure over the functions. So something that satisfies this inequality here, that the sum over the function of P of F equals one. It's just, and it should be non-negative, for example. And that's just a probability measure that we put on our function class. And it can be chosen arbitrarily. And for any such probability measure, we will get a bound. Because then we can replace delta of F by delta PF, plug it here, and see what it, what it gives us. And that's following. We obtain that. So now this delta is the fixed little confidence uh, value that we set before. Um, and we obtain that with high confidence, 
for all functions in our class, the expectation of the function is bounded by the empirical expectation plus this uh, term that you start to be familiar with. So this is the confidence factor. And here, we have something that is, again, a logarithmic term, but which involves this 1 over p f quantity. So let's uh, connect this to the finite case. In the finite case, we can simply take this probability to be uniform over the class of functions. So each function is assigned the probability 1 over capital N, which means that this quantity will be log of capital N. Okay, so we recover the, the, the previous bound that we had in the finite case. But of course we can do something else, like we, we can choose to, even in the finite case, to give some more weights to certain functions, and, and then we will have a different bounds for those functions. So what do we have gained here? Um, well, of course, we're, not, we're no longer restricted to the finite case, because we can define such a probability measure on a countable mm -hmm. set of functions by simply uh, having a decreasing weight. Okay, so now we have a bound that holds for the countable set of functions. But of course, if we order the functions, so let's say we have a set of f of functions uh, indexed by the natural number, let's say f1, f2, and so on. We can give a weight that, say, like, assume we have a natural ordering of this function in our class we can give a weight that decays. And that is such that the sum of the weights converges to 1. Okay, so that would be a probability measure on an uncountable set. And if we apply this, uh, I mean, if we take this probability measure into the bound, it will tell us that for functions that are uh, low in the ordering, the probability is high, which means the log 1 over the probability is small. So we will, we will get a better bound for those functions than for the functions here. And that seems very artificial, because uh, if, you, if I change the ordering, then I get a better bound for other functions and a, uh, a worse bound for, uh, for another type of function. So I can really play around with this, and I, I can generate uh, all the bounds that I want in some sense. But you have to keep in mind that it doesn't mean that the functions perform good. It's not because here I have set this function to a high probability value that when I take a sample, this function will have a, a small error and this function will have a bigger error. It's just the function behaves in a certain way. Okay? Each function individually behaves as dictated by object inequality. But then it's my choice to make this union bound over the class of functions and to give some kind of preferred way to some function. So I will get uh, a bound that is good for the functions that are early in my ordering and which is worse here. But this is independent on the actual performance of the function. But it's really a mathematical trick to, to give some kind of preference. And if, of course, if my algorithm turns out to be an algorithm that picks always the functions that are early in this ordering, then I will get a good bound for this algorithm. But it doesn't mean that it will perform better. It's just that my bound will be more uh, uh, refined for this algorithm. So I, I somehow, it's a way to incorporate knowledge about the algorithm into the bound. Okay, so that's what is written here. It's just a matter of choice. And of course, in the, in the worst case, we can say, well, if I know my algorithm will always return this function, let's say f0 in our class f, then I can put all the weights, put weight 1 on this function, and then this term vanishes. And I recover update bound. But of course, it, doesn't, it works only for, uh, for this specific function. So I, this will be good here somehow. Because I give all the weight to one function, which means I authorize the algorithm just to fit this function. And important thing is that I have to choose P before seeing the data. So I cannot say, well, let's run the algorithm and let's see what function it returns and let's give all the weights to that function. That would not be possible because uh, then you would have a 
description that depends on the data and uh, the derivation that I've made before will not work. Okay, so I mean this this is a bit uh, surprising, I would say, and it takes some time to really understand what's going on. So think about it, and if you have questions, don't hesitate.
compute the number of bit, of bit vectors that we obtain and take the maximum. And that's this quantity here. And it's a function of the sample size. Okay, so uh, doing this on the function class, on the loss class f, or doing this on the um, classifier class does not really make a difference. Um, in this, you have the, the, the labels of the y's that enter, but it really does not make a difference because uh, making a mistake is like uh, choosing the opposite class. So, I mean, you can write it down if you want, and it's easy to see that they are really the same. So even the, the, the cardinal of f t1 tm is the same as the cardinal of g uh, x1 tm. Okay. And the result is the following. Once we have this function, this gross function, uh, assume we were able to compute it, then we would have this bound, which says tells us that this hyperbolic over the sampling of the data again. Yeah? For all classifiers in my class, the risk of the classifier is less than the empirical risk plus, again, the square root, confidence, number of data, and the complexity term is here, the logarithm of the gross function. And you notice that it's computed not for n data points, even though I have a sample size of n, but for two n data points. And we'll see why in the derivation. So this is very nice, because this applies even to infinite sets of functions. Uh, and even if you look at a finite class of functions, then this is always less than capital N. Because remember, this is a number of possible bit vectors that you obtain when you compute the function on your uh, data. So there cannot be more than N, because we have at, at most N functions. So this is always better than the finite uh, bound. But of, of course, the question is, how do we compute this? I mean, it seems a bit complicated. Remember, I take these vectors compute how many I have, and take the maximum over all possible sets of points. So it's a bit uh, non-trivial. The switch remark is always better than the characters if we have the mid to the two removed and the eight to four. OK, sorry, yeah. up, up to the constant. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the final case, we have one here, a two here. So doesn't make a Okay, let's, if we look just at this term, this term is less than log and capital. Okay. So, and how to compute this? It turns out to be uh, easily upper bound, uh, I mean, you can upper bound it easily using this quantity called the Bartnitsch of the dimension that we introduce now. So, as I told you, this, when you look at the trace of the set of functions, on the data, you obtain binary vectors. So they can take uh, two values. So if you look at the SG, it will be plus or minus one. And if you look at SF, it will be zero or one. So in, uh, at most, we can have two to the n different vectors. So you know that this is always finite and bounded by two to the n. So that's the first estimate. But it's a bit good, because if you put it in this bound, then log of 2 to the n is n, essentially. So here you would have n divided by n, so you, have, you would have a constant. So we don't get the fact that when the data, the number of data increases, we convert to 0. So that would be used as well. So we need something a bit more refined than just this true number of Okay? So now we define this quantity here. I mean, the whole thing that this will be significantly smaller than 2 to the x. Otherwise, there is nothing we can do. Okay? And we define this quantity, the VC dimension, which is the largest integer such that the gross function computing on n data points is equal to 2 to the n. So what does it mean? If we have a few number of points, like if we have two points, then it's it's likely that with a big class of function, we can obtain all possible bit vectors between 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Okay, but maybe if we have more points, then after some time, we don't have enough functions to generate all possible bit vectors. And 
the sample size for which this occurred, which means for which we can no longer uh, generate all possible bit vectors, will be, uh, well, not the BC dimension, but one plus the BC dimension. So the BC dimension is the last index for which we can uh, separate the points in all possible ways. Okay, we'll see immediately an example to give you an idea of what it means. So let's consider the class of hyperplanes in R to the D. So here it's R2. And the uh, hyperplanes are represented by lines. Okay. And uh, we look at all possible bit vectors that we can generate using these lines. And on this data set here, we have three crosses here. And we can separate them by lines. So here we separate this one from these two ones. But we can think of it also at the opposite. We can separate these two ones from this one. So we can actually generate the vector 1, 0, 0, or 1, 1, 0. Okay. We can separate those two from this one, and so on. And those two from this one. We can separate those three from, from the rest, which means that the vector is 1, 1, 1, or 0, 0, 0. So we can generate actually all possible bit vectors of size 3. So we, uh, our gross function is 2 to the, to the 3, so which means 8. We can generate all possible 8 bit vectors. But for four points, there is no uh, arrangement of, I mean, no, sorry. We can find four points such that it is not possible to generate all possible uh, bit vectors for those four points with using only lines. Like for example, we cannot generate the vector that is 0, 0, 1, 1. There is no line that separates those two from those two. Okay? And so then we say that the BC dimension is three. Because we can separate, we can, uh, say, we say shatter. Shatter means uh, give, uh, produce all possible classification. We can shatter three points, but there is a set of four points that we cannot shatter. So BC dimension is three. And that can be generalized in R to the D. The BC dimension of hyperplanes is D plus one. Okay, that's here, how we compute it. We find uh, a set of points that can be shattered. Uh, I mean, we have to ensure that uh, any set of points of size D can be shattered, but no set of points of D plus 1 can be shattered. <laughs> 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 it's a bit confusing. Uh, yeah, we have to find a set of points that can be shattered of size of dimension D, and we have to find a set of points of dimension D plus 1 that cannot be shattered. Yes. Yes, but yeah. So, but also you have to ensure that for uh, size uh, D, I mean, for size D, all sets of points can be shattered. No, because if you have just one, then the superman. Okay. So it's clear for you, but not for me. Okay. So, I mean, if we look again at this example, uh, there is another uh, interpretation. To specify the hyperplane in dimension D, we need uh, D plus one parameters. We need uh, the direction of the normal vector uh, plus the offsets. Right? So we can say, oh, looks like the BC dimension is equal to the number of parameters. So does that generalize to other classes of function? It turns out that it's not the case. So there are cases where you have a function <coughs> class which has one parameter, this function class here. So we take the sine of sinus of Tx or t in r, so the parameter is this uh, real number here. So this gives us these uh, sine functions here, okay? And which means the sine will be plus one here, minus one here. So it gives us uh, a function. I mean, you think of it. Uh, I, I draw only the sine, but you the sine of it, but you should uh, think what the sine looks like, okay? So it's something that looks like this. Here, here, um, and so we have only one parameter, but the, 
the VC dimension is infinite. And how to see it? it if you take points on this uh, real line, say integer points, okay, all the integer, uh, then by playing with this team, you can find, uh, and, and if you specify that this point should be positive, this point should be negative, and this one should be negative, then there is a value of t that satisfies that the, the sign of the symmetry will uh, match this sign that I've chosen. So I can generate all possible sets of bit vectors for this one by playing around with the t. That's why I have just one parameter, but infinite this dimension because I always to the end for any end uh, possible bit vector. So, so we know that given this definition of the VC dimension, we know that whenever we have a sample, a sample of size n less than the VC dimension h, the size, uh, I mean the, uh, the gross function is equal to 2 to the n, because we can generate all possible bit vectors. And the question is now what happens when we take a sample which is larger than h? We know that it won't be, the gross function won't be equal to 2 to the n, but how smaller will it be? Because if it's just a factor smaller, then we're still in trouble. Because the logarithm will still be too big. But there is a very nice property which is uh, captured by this lemma, which is that if you have a, a function class that has finite VC dimension, say h, okay, for example, the hyperplane, uh, Rd, uh, then the gross function is bounded in this way. So for all n, the gross function of the side of the set of size n is less than this sum here. Okay, and this is n choose i. So the number of ways we can choose i points in the set of size n. I will not go through the proof. It's a beautiful proof, but it's a bit uh, technical. And um, one important consequence that shows you what's what's happening actually is uh, the following. For n larger than the VC dimension, you can bound the gross function in this way. So essentially, it's polynomial in the number of examples. So it's really, we really have made, uh, here, the, we can see it here, there, there is really a different behavior before and after the VC dimension. In for the VC dimension, so here I put the logarithm of the gross function. So it's linear, which means we have two to the n uh, possible shatterings. And after the VC dimension, the gross decreases significantly because now we have a polynomial gross in the number of uh, examples. So when we take the logarithm, then we have logarithmic gross. So there is really. Uh, I mean, what you think of as a phase transition. If you look at small number of data, you, you can generate all possible bit vectors, and large number of data, only polynomial many bit vectors can be generated. And when we take the logarithm, then we're in good shape. That's what I got here. Uh, remember the bound, so it, it was like this, but here we have the logarithm of the gross function. Now, given the upper bound that we have here, we plug it in the bound, we obtain this, the logarithm of the gross function is now the VC dimension times the logarithm of n over the VC dimension essentially. So I mean, forget about the details, just remember that the error that we have is now of order VC dimension log n over n. Okay, and that's, that's a significant uh, improvement. So for hyperplanes, for example, in R D, there is no easy way to put weights. I mean, they are just not countable, so it's even impossible to put weights and use this previous technique that I mentioned with this E of F. Uh, and also, there is no reason to favor one hyperplane uh, instead of the other. There is no natural notion of simplicity. Uh, so using this approach, I mean, using this VC bound, we get something which is not trivial, which in this bound that goes to zero quite fast, just using this combinatorial argument by looking at how the data 
is shattered by the hyperplane. So that's what I meant when I said, look at the class of functions, the hyperplane through the data. Okay, so we can give some more interpretation of uh, what is the BC dimension. So as I told you, it's, it's not related in general to the number of parameters of your class of functions. So it measures something which is a bit more uh, effective in, in a way that is a bit more data dependent than, uh, than just the number of parameters. It's, it's some, some sort of measure of effective dimension. And we'll see some more of the measures uh, later on. It's heavily depends on the geometry of the class, as we saw, and how points can be shattered by this class. In a way, it gives a natural notion of simplicity. So when, whenever you have a class with low BC dimension, it means that you cannot generate just any possible classifier. It's not related to number of parameters. And whenever it is finite, okay, when H is finite, using this bound, we can show that, I mean, this bound does not depend in any way uh, on the distribution. This is true whatever the distribution of the data is. So whenever the VC dimension is finite, uh, this bound always holds and shows that the error goes to zero when the number of examples goes to infinity. So which means, I mean, that the class is learnable in some sense. So if we have enough data, we will be able to pick the correct function. So now we go to the proof. Uh, we go through the first uh, ingredient in the proof, which is called the symmetrization um, argument. Okay, so we have some more notations in the way of who they will be here. Um, the key idea is, remember that we want to bound this quantity. We want to bound the probability that, uh, okay, so this means P of S minus P N of S. And I kind of factor these two uh, expectations here. But, uh, just think of it as P of S minus P N of S. So we're looking at the maximum difference over the class of functions. The trick is to say, when I compare the, expect the two expectations to the empirical expectation, actually, I, I could also estimate the true expectation on an extra set of data. So that's what you do when you do validation, for example, uh, or cross-validation. You have your training data, you train your classifier on that data, and to estimate the error of this classifier, you take another set of data, which is independent, and compute the error on this set of data. And that's really the idea behind this technique here. We estimate the true average by P n prime here means an, another empirical average on another sample, which is called the ghost sample. So we um, assume that we have another sample uh, at our disposal, and we compute uh, the error of the function on this other sample. But of course, all this is uh, somehow mathematical. So we don't need to have this data. It's just, uh, it's just a technique. We say that if we add at our disposal another, another sample which is independent, d1 uh, prime to d1 n prime, then we would be able to compute, to approximate the true error by the empirical error on these x, y, x. And, and the lemma tells us that the difference between true and empirical on the first sample is bounded by the difference on, uh, but, uh, between empirical on the ghost sample and empirical on the initial sample. And we'll see how to prove it. It's relatively easy. So let's f and be the function that we shift this supremum in this first uh, bound here. So for each set of data, training data, there is a function f that we shift this supremum. That's the, our assumption. If it's not achieved, it's a bit more complicated, but let's assume it's achieved. So for this function, we write this quantity, this series of inequality here. Uh, so this is the indicator of this event. So the indicator that, indeed, the difference exceeds certain value t. Well, let's multiply it by the indicator also so it's a function that takes value 0, 1, depending on whether this is uh, this occurs. And here the event is that the difference between the true 
expectation of Fn and the empirical expectation on the ghost sample of Fn is less than a certain value. Okay? And uh, okay, that comes out of nowhere maybe, but uh, we'll see how to use it. So the product of these two indicator function is nothing but the indicator uh, of the conjunction of those two values. Okay, that's easy to see. If for this product to be one, we need those two events to be realized. So that's what we like here. The, this n, so this means n is. And if those two events are uh, realized, then we can easily deduce that the difference between pn prime and pn of fn will be larger than zero two. So if you see it, you just take this inequality and subtract this inequality in your thing. Okay, so if these two things hold, then this thing holds, which means that the indicator of this event is less than the indicator of this event. Okay, now we're almost done. Uh, we just have to take expectations here and there to obtain probabilistic statements. So the first thing we do is take the expectation with respect to this ghost sample, this uh, extra set of data z1 prime, dn prime. And this first term does not depend on the ghost sample, it only depends on the distribution and the empirical distribution, whereas this one depends on the ghost sample. That's why here this is a constant, and when we take the expectation of like, the indicator function, we obtain the probability of the other. Remember that's the trick. Expectation of an indicator is nothing but the probability of the other. And I, I denote it by P prime, which means that's the probability under the sampling of this second uh, ghost sample. And same thing here, we take the expectation in your case. Okay? Now the game is to bound this quantity here. So if you look at it, it reminds you a little bit uh, of these inequalities. Why is that? Because Fn, remember, Fn achieved the supremum of on the first difference. So Fn is the function that achieves the supremum here. And which means Fn depends on the original sample, not on the ghost sample. So uh, from the point of view of this uh, probability here, which is on the ghost sample, this is a fixed function. It depends on the, on the ghost sample that this has nothing to do with. So if this is a fixed function, then more or less I have the inequality here. But it's in the other way. So I just have uh, to revert it, so I take your opposite events. And actually, I don't even need update the inequality. I can even use Kepichev inequality, so the uh, non exponential bound. That's enough. And so this is just the probability that the true expectation and the empirical expectation on the sample of the fixed function is larger than such a value. This is less than, uh, remember, uh, I, read, uh, I mean, it's somewhere in the slide, Kepichev inequality. And you can bound this by the variance of this quantity, which is actually the variance of the function divided by n, because there is a scaling in the, in the function, in the, in the empirical expectation here. And the variance of my function, my function is, can say value 0, 1, and you can show that the variance of functions that take value 0, 1 is less than 1, 4. Uh, so I obtain this bound here. So that's the bound for this event, but I want to bound the opposite event, which means I just have to take 1 minus this. So the, the probability of this is 1 minus the probability of the other direction. And that's why I'm, I'm obtaining here 1 minus this. And, okay, now I just have to take expectation with respect to the initial sample. And here I will obtain the probability that P minus Pn larger than T. And here, I, uh, I would obtain a probability under the sampling of both uh, uh, samples, true uh, initial sample and both sample of this deviation here, and that's what the lemma is. This is probability of this deviation, and here is probability, but with respect to both the initial sample, the sampling of the initial sample, and the sampling of the cross sample. Okay, this is 